I'm MDCEO of Inside Out Media Limited. I started um, a talk show about 20 years ago, um, July of 1997, called Inside Out with Agatha. We now own a multi-purpose studio. In fact, we own three studios. And Inside Out, which started 20 years ago, has given birth to two other organizations, which is Trend FM, a radio station in Asaba, and Rave TV, which is a cable TV platform here in Lagos, operating on several platforms. Um, we now, I think for both stations, operate from our own building, which is a big plus considering where we came from. My name is Agatha Amata. This is how I got here. I'm even trying to remember what I used to do. It's like Inside Out has been my life for such a long time. But before I started Inside Out, I tried my hands on an office job. I worked in a finance house. I was quite good at that. In fact, that's where I caught my teeth in marketing. I was very good with the marketing aspect of it. But I, I found out that nine to five, um, I was very bad with taking to authority. I didn't follow protocol and rules and all of that. I knew I was not cut out for office job for an office job. It was it was very clear. I was always getting into trouble with my superiors. I didn't know when to shut up and um, just listen. I was very vocal and um, I I got a lot of queries until I finally threw in the towel. So um, it was obvious I didn't last very long there. I mean the two jobs I tried I didn't last because. I did not do well with um, protocol. So I knew that I wasn't cut out for that. And then I got married, I had my son, and I had took a sort of break from doing anything at all. And because of who I was married to, I was always involved in some way. In, um, when I think Nollywood was just starting out then, I always got called on to do stuff. If I wasn't reading scripts to say what I thought about it, I was just somehow involved in the in the background. I can't act to save my life, so acting was never a consideration. I'm very bad with that. But because I, I got involved in a lot of it that had to do with acting and, and um, um, the kind of scripts that came out, I sort of got pushed into the television world. And then I had always had a love for um, talk shows. Um, being able to express myself, being able to say whatever it is I wanted to say. And so uh, one day in, in the course of conversation, I just thought, why can't we have a proper talk show where people can air their views? And that was what gave rise to that. At the time, there really wasn't much in terms of, um, in fact, I don't think there was any major talk show on air at the time. And so there were no studios unlike now. So the, the closest we could get was the um, law auditorium in University of Lagos and they had tables. Um, I think it could sit about 200 people and I remember when we had our first recording on the 12th of July 1997 we practically had to bring a truckload of our colleagues in, 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 in then Nollywood, as it was just starting. The very first recording, we actually had to do something related to us so that we would have the kind of participation that I wanted. And it was, would you marry an actress or an artist, I think. And then Glamour Girls had just come out. And so we had Zach Oji on and it was quite explosive. It was a good way to start. Then we had the second topic, which is nasty habits of men. I can't forget because that sort of, created the templates by which we operated. Um, we stayed back at Unilag for another five, six, seven years, I think, before we knew we had outgrown our welcome there. And I still wasn't ready because at the time when um, I started the talk show, there were no talk shows. It was very difficult getting advertising. People didn't really know where to place it. So is this targeted at women or at children or at youths? There was nothing to compare it with. As in, at the time they had drama or music, things like that. You could define them and put them into boxes. The talk show thing was new. And because I was talking to a young audience, they were not sure, normally you would associate talk shows with women, but they were now not sure, should this be for women or should this be for children or should this be targeted at youths? It took a lot of convincing. And I remember that I was on air for the first two, three years without a TV commercial. 
and it was a struggle and we will go to Unilag, set up a lecture theater and I will try to record about six episodes on one day. So I would be standing from like 10 a.m. till like eight, sometimes 8, 9 p.m. Just to make sure because it was very capital intensive. Nobody had done that kind of thing where you gather 200 people plus um, for a whole day and just want them to talk. And people were not very willing to talk at the time. There was no social media. So, I mean, it was the closest you could get to social media and people were very wary of their privacy being invaded and stuff like that. So it was a struggle to get people to even express themselves on like what's going on today, where even we unsolicited, people would offer to tell you things about themselves. Um, that's where I'm coming from. And so by the time we, we, we sort of carved a niche because we were the only program at the time that was very vocal. Um, where you could come and say whatever you wanted to say and you'll be allowed. And if you're ready to take on the questions, come and sit down there and just be yourself. I think that was what made us get popular very quickly. And so we, we moved from um, the Unilag Lecture Theatre to the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research Lecture Theatre, which was bigger but still had the same challenge in the sense that it was a lecture theatre and so it had tables. Um, and we stayed there for, I think, about a year there about but I, I then said in my heart that I no matter how small even with all the struggles we had at the time that I had to try and find my own place and do my own thing no matter what the space looked like and we're able to um, get a space in Ilupeju um, we're paying rent we had to break down the sitting room kitchen everything that was downstairs we had to break it down and then turn the place into a recording studio and um, create a stage and all of that. It was small, but it was, it was our own. When Inside Out first started, one of the biggest challenges we had was the fact that we didn't have a space of our own and um, we basically had to use a lecture theatre. So on, on Monday to Friday, it is a classroom and then we had to use it on Thursday and make on Saturday and make sure we dismantle. So immediately after lectures on Friday, we had to bring the set people to come in and build a set that we would use all day on Saturday. And so we would, they would work overnight and then we will come in the morning. And then, I, I, in fact, I remember that I had to change on the balcony. There was no changing room. It wasn't built for that, it was a classroom. I would stand from morning till evening. In fact, by the time I finished recording, my feet will be swollen from the number of episodes I had to deal with. If I did five, that would be a bad day. And so I had to make sure I aimed for like six, minimum. After recording, I didn't even have a day off. It was to immediately go into the studio with the editor. I had to be there because I knew what I wanted to see. And we will edit as many as we could, at least one that would go on air. And Inside Out was showing on about 22 TV stations by that time. Um, I was the marketer, producer, presenter, um, coordinator, getting the audience, getting the guests. It was quite hectic. It was not an easy period. You know, the worst part is after you've done all of this, then you have to go and defend it and you are begging for advertising and you can't get it. But people are telling you your program is good, yet no advertising is coming and you are spending money to produce. You know, you get to a stage where you start to ask yourself, am I really doing the right thing? Or should I just throw in the towel and just give up? Because um, the people who are supposed to support your business don't think it's a good idea. So even if the whole world is applauding you, if revenue is not coming in, it's a hobby. That cannot sustain you. So you, you get to a point where you question yourself and say, should I try something else? And I did for a while. Um, I actually paused for about one year. But a lot of people didn't notice because I had episodes that were on, going on air. We, we had, I had done a lot of block shooting because of how I shoot, um, which also helped me that every time I, I wanted to shoot, I had to do like six episodes, seven episodes. So I had, um, uh, I had, accumulated episodes that hadn't been shown and so I took a break to say let me try something else when you love something I mean and you just know that no matter how bad it gets you will not 
you would, there's nothing else that will give you um, satisfaction. You go back to baking, selling, um, just trading. I'm not money oriented like that where I'll quarrel with somebody because they are owing me and stuff. So I just leave you be. And so what happened was I had given out a lot of stuff and I never got the money back for it. It was a terrible idea. Even with the baking I did and all of that, I, I, I was spending my money doing stuff for people that nobody was paying me. So I knew that I wasn't cut out for that kind of business. After this long break, by the way, on TV, there was no break. It was just in my life that there was a break. In fact, when we ran out of the episodes I had done, we started repeating popular episodes. So nobody really noticed, but it was my, it was my think time. Like, do I really want to do this? Do I want to go on? Should I try something else and see if it will work? Now, at the end of this period, I, I realized that it's sink or swim. This is what I love. And so I went back to it and I just kept with it. Um, I remember when I got my first advert, it was totally wrong and I'll never forget the story, which is one of the reasons why I never forget John Momo. Inside Out was showing on Channels TV and um, I got my first advert, an alcoholic um, beverage and I ran to, I was so excited like, oh my God, finally somebody believes in this program. Um, so I, I ran to Channels and I showed them the ad and I think then alcohol was you had to show alcohol after eight and my program showed at about 8 30 so i was i was super happy and you know channels wasn't as big then as it is now so it was easy to see mr momo and so i ran into go and see him and he had been a source of encouragement to me and all of that and then i showed him the ad i got and he goes this is alcohol and i said yes he says we're not airing it oh my god i can never forget that day and i said what he says no your program cannot take alcohol it doesn't go. And I said, it doesn't go. Somebody finally gave me another year. I said, we're not sure. In fact, I think I started crying. Because I just, after all that hard work, all that you And then he sat me down and he said something that I have never forgotten today. And he said to me, don't let people define you or define who you are. You have to decide for yourself what you want to do. And it might be difficult, but if you stay with it, you'll find somebody who will come to work with you on your own terms. And don't be disappointed, don't be discouraged. Your adverts will come. Because even channels at the time had a, had a challenge of advertising because people felt that um, uh, Nigeria could not have an all news station and make money. And so when he was talking, he was talking from the point of view, I understand where you're coming from, but just stay with it. Even though it was a very difficult pill to swallow, I learned a lot from that. It was hard for me to say to the agency, sorry, we're not going to run this ad. Probably the most difficult and disappointing thing I've ever had to do in my life, but it taught me a valuable lesson. It taught me a very valuable lesson. And it kept, that is something that I have stayed with throughout my 20 year journey of um, Inside Out. Now, what would I call my, my first break? Or my first real break? Because I, I, I got the sporadic ads once a while. It was when, um, Ashwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu was governor in Lagos State and then Dey Alake was commissioner for information. I haven't talked about this in, I don't think I've ever spoken about this, but I, I used to do all those topics then that needed um, government representation to defend their policies or things they had done. And I realized that every time I bring a, a government official on, they just keep singing their own praises. Like they keep talking about themselves and their government and what they've done and it was, at first, I didn't really give it thought, you know. I was like, okay, that's what the person does for a living, like with anybody else who comes on the program. But when I it got to a stage where I realized that, oh my God, these people are advertising themselves and I'm allowing them and I'm paying for airtime for them to, well, I never paid airtime really, but basically I'm providing them with airtime to come and a platform to come and sing their own praises. They should pay me. And I didn't really think anybody would pay me, but I just thought they should pay me. At least I should ask. And then I asked through the Commissioner for Information, then Mr. Delia Lake. And I said, look, we can come to a partnership. These are some of the topics I've done. And this is how I think you can benefit. If you believe in your policies and what you're doing, come, sit down, let's, let's, but you pay me. Take on the questions, sing your praises all you want. Just be ready to take on my... 
and they bought the idea. And I earned my first real money and I thought, oh my God, so this is, is even possible. It was just something I tried. And, and, and that was when a door opened. I had um, um, commissioners come on the program, even for health related topics. It didn't take away anything from the essence of my program, yet I was making money. And it, I, I, I still was able to question them and do everything I would normally do. And they liked the idea of it, that they could come somewhere and defend the things they believed in. And I think that was, that was what opened my eyes a bit. Now, after that, I would say my first real, real break, I mean, that came and it was, it was new. So, I mean, it wasn't often, but it was a new revenue earner. Now, my first real break came when I wanted to, when they, by this time, I mean, I think, well, another administration had come in and they were talking about paying taxes in Lagos. Lagos was about to take on a new face, so to speak and they wanted to start their revenue generation. And they started this self-assessment thing where you have to fill a form and all of that. And I saw all that they were trying to do from the days of Ashwa Jibola Ahmed Tinubu to um, Afashala. And I thought, okay, let me pay my tax. So I went, they said you could go to a bank and pick up um, um, the form. So I went to a bank, I picked up the form. I looked at it and I didn't understand anything. And then I thought, why did they say this thing is easy to fill? And immediately, I just thought, I'm going to the, the Lagos State um, Board of Internal Revenue. I'm going there. And I got there and I asked to see the chairman. And I, 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 that was Mr. Babasunde Fowler. And um, I didn't know him from anywhere. I just told him, I said, you guys lied. Because your form is not easy to fill. And he said, really? And I caught his attention immediately and I showed him the form. I said, you are looking at it from the eye of somebody who knows. I've never paid tax. I want to pay tax. I'm looking at your form. I'm not encouraged to fill it. That's the end of that. And he said, he was asking me what I don't understand. And I started taking him step by step. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what? Come on inside out. If, I, if me who is educated cannot understand it, I'm sure there are many others who cannot. And we started. In fact, I became like the media mouthpiece for LIRS. And so I, it was the first time I was going to have a partner. I was going to be somebody's media partner for, because he needed to reach out to people and I could provide him access and people could, he could have interaction and people could ask questions. And we started that. It was so successful that other government bodies started to come on the platform. So Loma wants to start his PSP operation. Loma sends for me and we have a meeting. MTN wants to start some media and publicity thing, they sent for me. Unilever, people just, it was as if they just suddenly opened everybody's eyes like, oh my God, this platform is here and everybody can use it. And I started getting a lot of offers to partner with a lot of people and I was getting paid. So that for me was like the major, it was the eye opener for me. That was like the big break that I needed. And Mr. Babatunde Fowler, provided it and by the time i mean we had so many episodes by the time he came on and he like sort of gave it his own stamp of approval the floodgates just opened everybody could see it everybody remembered that you know they used inside out for tax the 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 chairman of lirs was there then the md um, i think it was gm or i don't know what he was called of loma or md of loma was also on the program then the md of um, you know all the other parastatals just everybody just started coming if Fowler is doing it it's a good program and you know he kept talking about it and we were on so many channels that every time he we had one of those recordings he got calls from everywhere you know people were calling when Loma tried it, and it was almost like each one tell one. So this person will tell this person, and the next thing, somebody else is contacting you and say, oh, there's this thing we want to do. Can we come on the program? It got so bad that people wanted to start to sell motorcycles and rice on my program, and I said, no, that doesn't go, you know? And I think that was where the, the big break came for me. Inside Out basically deals with topical issues. So if we're recording Inside Out now, I can immediately tell you what kind of topics will be treating. So some of the topics we'll be treating right now that, are, that I, I believe are issues everybody, we're talking about gambling. Every young person now gambles. I mean, gosh, there's nobody that does it. We'll probably be talking about um, molestation, domestic violence, 
those are the kind of issues. They're in your face. They're there every day. Um, we'll be talking about ASU strike because that has just happened. Um, because Inside Out deals with issues that affect everybody, um, we never run out of issues. So in, by the time we're ready to record, um, and we have recording seasons because of the way Inside Out goes, so we can do three months of recording, take a break, and then come back and do every Saturday three months. So by the time it's our recording season, we usually would have something like 30 something topics that have been written by my team. Um, I have producers, depending on what the issue is. So we would have written all those topics and then we look at them and say, okay, which ones should we deal with now? And then we pick those ones. And a lot of the time, it has gotten easier. Initially, I did all the work that like six or seven people are doing now. So now, I mean, I'm just enjoying life. So, I mean, when, when I started, it was a case of, we'll look at the issues. There are only two of us to gist and talk about what are we doing. Then I started to look for my guests. I was, I was there doing everything at the time. Um, so I, I look at what I am interested in talking about, what I think will provoke a, a response um, that would create discourse which are usually very topical issues. And I found out that, um, as I dealt with Inside Out, that there were two categories of people that were most affected by almost any issue I deal with, young people and women. And when young people are usually a lot more vocal. So when you're dealing with an issue that concerns young people, you, are, you tend to get a very robust interactive discourse. So I started leaning towards, because I, I, I was trying to make sure that I maintained the tempo of the program and encouraged people to tune in. So I started dealing a lot more with things that affect young people because they are the ones who don't send, for want of a better word. They'll tell you exactly what's on their mind. They were easier as guests. When you have young people in your audience and you're talking about an issue that affects them, you hear all sorts. It became like a no holds barred. Um, um, once a while I would do those very emotional ones or those humanitarian ones or human angle stories, widowhood and things like that. But a lot of the time I did things that affected young people and um, it helped. It helped the popularity of the program actually to be able to do that because then I was able to get immediate um, uh, response if you like to a lot of the issues and feedback was instant. So yes, um, so when, 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 when then, when, when it's time and I have my topics and I know the kind of people I want, experts, and we look at the, what the panel should be made up of, the, the guests who are coming on the program, then we reach out to them and try to um, put it together. And then we now start worrying about the audience. We used to invite people in groups, clubs, associations, NGOs, like that. Because in the, the USP for Inside Out is its audience. So if you don't have an audience, you don't have a program. And getting a lot of people together at the same time so you can start early was a very difficult task. Um, when we waited, before we, we, it was a case of we wait for people to come, we found out that that wasn't working. You can have 10 people come in together and then next thing, they'll be strolling in one one for the next three hours and you can't do anything because it's not enough for you to record with. So you're just stranded. So we started, um, what we then started doing was to try and get people who we'll say to you, can you get a bus of people who will pay or we'll send a bus to pick up your people, just put them together in one position. By the time we get three buses like that, we know we can start. That was one of the things we learned to do um, in com because that's almost the most difficult thing. The audience, a lot of programs have tried and they had to abandon it halfway. But we couldn't because that was what made us different, our audience. And so we had to devise a means by which we could get our audience together at the same time. And then it helps us start our recording early. So we, we started doing groups, associations, things like that, providing transport or transport fare for a whole team of people to come in at the same time. Those were some of the challenges we faced and we found our way around them. I can officially say I've stepped down because there's a new face of Inside Out, so I can say I, I loved what I did. Um, it, was, it was not work. 
when you when you love what you do and you're passionate about it, even when you face the challenges, you know that there's nothing else you'd rather be doing. Even if I had an office job that was paying me a lot of money, I wouldn't get the job satisfaction. And so I knew that I somehow had to make this work. I, I didn't, I can't, I had to keep thinking outside the box, like there must be some way. I, it got to the stage where I said, okay, I'm not, I'm only going to work with stations. Everybody knew me as a person who would never pay airtime. But those were some of the things I had to come up with to survive. So I said, I would only partner with, I would only work with stations that were ready to partner with me. My production cost is already very high. I cannot be paying anyone airtime or else I won't survive this. So no matter how fantastic this help me a station is, except they're willing to partner with me, i.e. no airtime. I provide program, you provide airtime, and we share revenue whenever that revenue comes. That was one of the most sensible decisions I took. That helped me. The, 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 the second thing I think was also to say I had to block shoot so I can have off seasons. So when I am shooting in bulk, I, can, I, I work myself to the bone knowing that you know you're going to do this for maybe three months and you're going to have enough to carry you for the next six plus months sometimes seven eight months depending on how successful it was and that gives me a breather i can recover from that period in that time look for advertising do marketing and other things those were some of the things that i had to design then later i started thinking how do I make the content itself generate money for me? Which was where um, things like the Lagos take off, Mentef, LIRS and Co came in. So I, I had to keep thinking. And the reason why I was able to do that is because I loved doing what I did. And so I had to look for ways to make it work, for it to be able to sustain itself. And uh, you know, everybody says this, but it's also God that, that gives you the wisdom to do what you do. So first of all, I'll say it's God, then I'll say it's passion, and then looking for new ways to reinvent yourself. And that's what has kept me going this far. I think um, it was when Inside Out turned 10, I said to myself, I said, okay, so how long are you going to keep doing this for? What would you do next? What would you like to do? I I thought then, oh, it would be nice to have a TV and a radio station. That was about 10 years ago. And I thought, hmm, this one that the program is not even bringing you money. You're thinking TV and radio. But I said, well, everything is possible. And then I wrote two names down. I wrote Trend FM and Trend TV. Um, I had no idea how it was going to happen, what was going to happen, nothing. I just wrote it down. I said, that's where I'm going to next. Um, and I remember um, when I think Inside Out turned 15, which was five years later, I applied for a radio license, Trend FM, for Lagos. And they told me they were not giving out radio licenses. No, I applied two years before. I think um, Inside Out was 12. And then I said something to myself. I said, I'm going to retire from inside out before I'm 50. Even though I had no plan or anything, I, I also said, I said, so I want to know what I'm doing after that. And I said, I'm not going to do inside out. By the time I'm 50, I, will, I, will be, I, will be, I should be doing something else. Those were the things I said to myself without any, I can't say I had any great plan of what was going to be happening after that. I just had all these ideas running in my head. And so when Inside Out turned 15, um, I met the Delta State Governor, the then Delta State Governor at an event. Now he, it so happened that he had been watching Inside Out and he had seen again, the LIRSs, the LOMAs, he had seen all those people come on the program. And he was one of those few people who realized that they were actually, I, I guess because he's a politician as well, or a government official, he knew that it was a good avenue. He knew what they knew in Lagos, let me put it like that. And so he sent for me at that event. I didn't even know him at the time. I didn't know who the Delta State Governor was. And he had obviously gone to find out information about me. And when I met him, he said, I've been looking for you. You're from Delta State. Why are you helping Lagos State? 
and I, 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 I was just looking at him because I didn't. He said, all those things you do with widows, all those things you do with uh, the tax people and co. And so I knew that the guy had been watching. He now said, I want you to move your program to Delta State. And I'm like, Delta State. He said, are you not from Delta State? Are you not from Mebu and all that? I was surprised he had so much. He said, no, I've been looking for you everywhere. I was like, why is this Delta girl becoming a Lagos girl? And so I was introduced to Delta State government at that level. I mean, that was just divine because it was a youth program. I had no idea who that the Delta State governor was going to be there. I didn't even know who the Delta State governor was. And when he was called to called up to give his opening remarks, he saw me and in, sent, told them to bring me up to come and give the opening remarks in this place. I have, I, I mean, that just has to be divine. Now that happened, and I, I just knew that there was, there was a reason um, because I wasn't even meant to be at that in, event in the first place. So by the time um, I had a talk with him. And he said he wanted me to come and do the inside out recordings and i said oh i was even thinking of going somewhere else for my 15th anniversary the inside out turns 15 this year I said come back to your state and i was able to come back and have sponsored epi episodes from and by the delta state government which was awesome it was it was good to do um to to have inside out recorded somewhere else and then I got to Delta State, which is, which is another thing I thank God for, the ability to see opportunity. When I got to Delta State five years ago, I was in my car at about past nine and I heard the national anthem on radio. And I asked the driver, I said, why are they, because I, you know, you are in Lagos. I've never heard the national anthem on any radio station for that matter, except there's a presidential broadcast. So I asked the, my driver then, I said, why are they playing the national anthem? He said, oh, madam, they don't close. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, no, the station don't close. I said, it's past nine. He said, eh. He said, the last one will close 10 o'clock. So as soon as that one shut down, he changed the channel. And at 10, I heard the national anthem again. I've never heard the national, I don't think I've ever heard the national anthem since I was maybe two. I don't know. But I mean, it was ridiculous. So I said to him, I said, so at 10, he said, everybody don't close. And we had to swap to CD. And as soon as he said that, I thought, oh my God, you mean there's still states where people shut down TV and radio? And then I, I immediately, I, I heard that. I just thought, this place needs a radio station. This place needs a radio station. I had applied for a radio station two years earlier. They said it needed presidential approval, which I never got because they said Lagos was congested and they were not giving out licenses anymore. So I called NBC and I said to them, I said, please, I want to find out what has happened with my application for a radio station. And they go, no, you asked for Lagos. We told you to ask for somewhere else and you never come back to us. I said, can I change it to Asaba Delta State? They went, oh yes, there's no radio station there. You can ask for Asaba Delta State. And I changed the application immediately to Asaba Delta State. And it took a while. In fact, I got frustrated because they said at the time, the politics was just, the elections were just coming up. And they said the president at the time had stopped signing because he didn't want anything used against him. And you know, all the stories. So I got really tired of waiting because I thought it was going to come out immediately because I said there was no radio station. Meanwhile, the two stations I had heard were operating from across the bridge. There was none on that side of town in Delta State. None. There was none in that state. It was just Onicha, Enugu. That's where the two. And they were speaking a lot of Igbo. Now, here's something I found out. Having started... I haven't, because I was working with the Delta State government, and I say that very boldly. There, there's no state that has in, as many institutes, um, institutions of higher learning like Delta. There's almost no area where there's no uni or campus or just something. So there were all these young people who had to listen to Igbo. And um, my head was just spinning. I was like, for real? For real? That you mean there's this Look at money walking the streets. That's how I literally saw it. And nobody is taking advantage of it. So there's Abraka campus of this. There's Ugwashuku campus of that. There is, um, um, uh, what do you call that? Almost every sector, every small 
community had some campus, some uni, some education institute, some, do you understand what I mean? Delta, um, Edo State was next door. There was all that opportunity and nobody was harnessing it. And so it was with plenty of gladness that I changed my application. The next day I wrote a new letter asking for a Saba Delta State and they told me that, okay, we'll look at that. That should be easier. Two years later, that licensing come up. So from my very high spirits, I came back to reality, I thought, okay, do something else. <clears throat> so I asked after TV, and I was told that they were no longer giving terrestrial licenses, but I could get a digital license because we're going digital, and you know, that should be happening. Like, this was like, it's supposed to have happened like three years ago, but yeah, one day we'll get there. And so I said, okay, since they're not giving me, and I, was, I said, so does the digital license also require presidential approval? They said, no, for cable it doesn't. It's only if it's terrestrial that it requires. So why don't you start by asking for a license to operate on cable? And I thought, okay, so I can start with that. So I started Rave TV. That gave rise to Rave TV um, at the time. And my aim was, I was like, I want to create an interactive platform for young people that's why blogs are so popular because people can talk back young people to, of today don't want to sit down and listen to anybody they want to be part of the conversation and let it be on start time because start time seemed to have um, the masses market and i thought okay let's do start times and we started to put all of that together for rave tv rave tv was eight months old and i got a call it's giving your license for trend effect I had totally forgotten about that. The money I wanted to use to start Trend, I had put it into Rave. Then my license for Rave for Trend comes. Oh, by the way, when I wanted to apply, I used the name I had written like five years ago, Trend FM, because it was Trend I applied for first. So when I was going to apply for TV, I asked for my Trend TV. They said there's a cable TV in Port Harcourt called Trend TV. So I couldn't use that name. So I started thinking, what is close to trend? Something that is trending, something that is trending. What means like almost the same? And we started touting names and I got Rave. And Rave seemed to work and so we did Rave TV. Now by the time the license came out, don't forget that I applied many years before. I now got Trend FM. And I said, can I change the name now to Rave FM? They said no because you have, this is not a new application. This is like starting all over again and you will need another presidential approval. And I'm like, okay, no way. We'll stick with Trend FM and then Rave TV. So that was how both hit me almost at the same time. And I thought, God, you have a sense of humor. This is I've been waiting for, for like forever. So as soon as I put, invest my money into TV, radio comes, and then they tell me that, you know, we advise you to start immediately. And it was another challenge in my life, but I'm glad to say that today Trend FM is doing very well. In fact, in that region, it's rated number one, even from the agencies monitoring it, and it's not easy. It has not been easy. But um, like I said, when you enjoy what you do, you will have to keep finding ways. There's no other way. I think when you persevere, you must be willing to push on. You must know that nothing in life comes easy. If you're grateful for the good, you have to also accept the bad. Um, so when, I, when a dog slams in my face, I don't think that's the end of the world. I actually don't expect every door to open. So um, even when I get told no, my, I say to you, change, that, change your mind or you look for me later. I, I, I'm able to accept the good and the bad same way. I don't get overly excited at a yes, and I don't get overly disappointed at a no. I just believe it's part of the process. And for me, I, I tend to look at it that, you know, if you say no to me, it's because you don't understand. Because I, I am very sure of what I carry. I'm very sure of what I have to offer. And I, I, I tend to think in terms of, it's your loss. You'll find out later. So let me go to someone else who understands. I believe that, um, also being able to recognize when to move on and when something is not working. It doesn't mean that it's a bad idea, not necessarily, but to also know that it might not be the right time.
so you don't keep knocking your head against a brick wall. Um, if I believe in something, it doesn't necessarily mean, I also realize that it doesn't mean the person I'm talking to believes in it too. I, if I want to buy, get that person's buy-in, I have to be able to convince them. And where they don't see it, I must know when to take a bow and say, you know what, I tried. I, I think it is also not carrying everything on your head, like you know all. To, to allow yourself fail and still be happy with yourself and not feel very disappointed. So I take the good and the bad both. I mean, I, I accept it as a process that I have to go through in life. Um, and to see every failure on every shut door and every no as an opportunity to try the next, which might end up being bigger. I am a perpetual optimist. I believe strongly that no human being determines my destinies. It's, it's in God's hands. And, you know, I have this prayer I say every time when I'm, when I, before I step out in the morning. It's not very long. I'm not a prayer warrior or anything like that. I just say, Father, order my steps to be at the right place at the right time and use me to your glory. That's the end of my prayer. Because here's what I realize that when God orders your steps, you can't step and miss. And if he uses you to his glory, you cannot but be a shining star. Those are two very key things. And because I know that, um, I, I just accept whatever comes like, okay, so this is not for now or it's not for here or it's not for me. There's something else, there's something bigger. And, and I think that has helped me through a lot of very difficult periods, um, including now when, you know, two companies started out, it was meant to be one. Now we have two starting at about the same time. And you know what the economy is saying. And so sometimes you get really, really difficult periods. But, you know, I just say to myself, Father, you didn't bring me this far for a reason. And I know that there's something that's going to come out of this and somehow manage to find my way through because I am sure that the difficult problems um, times will come, but I'm also sure that the good times will come. Basically, I just want to be happy. I want to be content with what I have and where I am. And I am. I'm very thankful to God for how far he has brought me. This is what I've learned, that you, I can't even outthink God because everything that I have been able to achieve I cannot tell you that is according to hard work or some design I had or some fantastic plan I had that would be a lie which means that whatever I have thought about doing God has blessed it and multiplied it so what that keeps that keeps me in an attitude of gratitude because when I look out and I look at this building and I say, gosh, you have the same thing in Asaba. Oh, you have a house here, you have a house there, or you have this, or your children are doing well. I know I'm not the most hardworking person. There are people who work harder. It's favor. And I'm very grateful for that favor. I don't take it for granted because it's not everybody who has it. And so it keeps me humble. It keeps me grounded such that I don't, I don't worry about material things. There's something my staff always say to me. They, they always say to me, Ma, how come you always give out things without thinking? I can give you my last 50 naira because I know that it is not mine. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I didn't work for it. I just went through a process and God blessed that process. There are people who have done times three of what I've done and have not seen 50 naira. And because I realize and acknowledge that, I, I, I am able to not let material things. I have seen money and I've been broke. If that would put it in perspective, I have seen a lot of money and I have been very broke. Two extremes. So when I am very rich, should I then be extremely happy? Like it's still money. And you know, I say to, sometimes I sit down and I laugh at myself when I'm broke and I'm worrying and I say, hmm, this money when you see, when, do you understand? It's, it's just, it's a state of mind. It's, it is all a state of mind. If you, if you had 10 billion Naira and you went to the UK and took that money in cash and handed over to a British person, they won't accept it from you because Naira is of no value to them. There are women that you go to in the village and you give them hundred dollars and they will want 1000 Naira because they have never seen the dollar. It is, it is, it is, a, it is, it is how you perceive or see that it is. That is how it becomes. So if you allow all these things determine 
make you, mar you, determine when you're happy, when you're sad. Sometimes it will happen because you're human, but you have to be able to do a rewind and remind yourself of where you're coming from. And also tell yourself that where you are is not as a result of you or your effort. It is God blessing the work of your hands. That is why you are where you are. When you are able to do that, I, I, I think I remembered some time that someone came to see me and they were saying to me, um, they, 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 were, they actually wanted to find out from me. They said, how do you know that all the people who come to ask you for money are not lying and taking advantage of you? That you give, 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 give. How do you know that they're not just taking advantage of you? And it was an interview actually. And you just give them because we help you here. You do stuff for widows. You pay children's school fees. And I said, I don't think that far. That's wasted energy. If I want to help you, I'll help you. If you are lying, it's between you and your God. It doesn't mean I would let people take me for granted. There are people that I see that are outright liars. And of course, I don't, I don't humor them. But when I am in doubt, I choose to give rather than not give. One is that I found out that God doesn't owe. And the one who has provided for me will provide for me again. And secondly, if you have chosen to use your mouth to put yourself in a bad position, why should that be my problem? If you want to become a beggar the rest of your life, why should I let that bother me? And you want to put me in the position of a giver. Why shouldn't I accept that position? Why should I worry? If you are lying because of 10,000 or 15,000, it's not going to carry you for the rest of your life. At the very most, if you are very prudent, one month, you'll be broke again. So why should I let that bother me? So my, my principle about life and some of my success is that a giver can never lack. And I don't hesitate to give where I can, one. Two, I don't worry about what I cannot fix. I am thankful for the things that I already have. Thirdly, I don't look at anybody and wish to be like anyone. Everybody has their own path to go. I know I have mine. And I keep asking God every day to show me what that path is. And so I never join what is popular. I do what is me. So I can wear a dress that is 1,500 naira and go for an event where they say it's black tie and I'll be very comfortable. I do not feel the need to impress anybody. I know who I am. I'm comfortable in my skin and I'm comfortable in myself. I, I, I believe that I am my own content, not what I wear. Agatha is Agatha. Agatha is not determined by whether her dress is 5,000 naira or 500 naira. Agatha that is wearing bathroom slippers is just as important as Agatha that is wearing high heel shoes. And I recognize that. I recognize that about me. So that gives me the ability. I can be anywhere and say anything and do anything. I don't think about it. If I've said rubbish, sorry. If I've said something that makes sense, that's fine as well. I am able to laugh at my stupidity if I'm stupid. I'm able to say I don't know if I don't know. I think that is a key ingredient that has worked for me. And let me tell you what that has helped me do. It has helped me get away with a lot of things that my colleagues can never try. Because everybody accepts that that is who I am. Everybody knows. It, it, it's sort of, you can't gossip about me to somebody who knows me. They'll tell you Agatha won't do that. And they also know that you can, there are certain things you cannot say about me. It's like going to say to somebody, I bought a bag for $8,000. If you tell that to anybody who knows me, then go say you they lie. I can't even buy weave on that is 80K. I will use 2,500 Naira weave on. And I will tell you how much it is. Because I know me. I know who I am. And it, it has helped get me out of a lot of trouble. I don't feel the need to belong, to be liked or hated. I don't feel a need to do anything but be myself. So I'll say that is one of the biggest things that has helped me to getting to where I am. I can quietly do my thing and not feel under pressure to be anybody else or do it at anybody's pace or the way anybody thinks it should be done. That would, that would be, I think, one of the biggest things I have learned.